I was always the weird kid. I often spent time in the school library, huddled over books on UFOs, because that's how I felt, like an alien from another planet. I made weird facial expressions, movements, and sounds in all the wrong contexts. In the playground, instead of trying to make friends with kids through a conversation, I would simply walk towards them while earnestly singing. <laughs> I couldn't make or keep a friend for a long, long time. As a grown up, I finally got an explanation when I was diagnosed as autistic. And while this didn't happen until well into adulthood, being autistic has always been what makes me, me. It stands for my experience of reality, my challenges, my abilities, my creativity, and my imagination. It's shorthand for my experience of time, space, and the world around me. The neurotypical world, however, teaches us that differences like mine are not okay. That being weird is a problem to be fixed. But I've tried to fit in. Maybe you have too. It rarely works. And the cost of trying for autistics and for all of us is too high. Throughout my 20s as a journalist, I was successful but worn down. I had migraines more often than not. I would emotionally break down every couple of months and I hopped between jobs looking for the thing that would help me feel okay. At the peak of my career, I found myself in LA, the founding editorial director of a burgeoning women's media empire. I was building brand partnerships for the likes of Google and Uber. I was leading a team to create Webby award-winning content enjoyed by millions. And I was host of a hit podcast. You could say the weird kid had made it. But privately, I was plagued with anxiety. I was in and out of hospital after being sick and stressed for far too long. And when I finally crashed, I crashed hard. Just like autism is a spectrum, so is autistic burnout. Autistic burnout is the term for what happens when autistics are put under long-term stress with a lack of support to manage it, when social expectation conflicts with personal ability. For me, it involves losing much of my previous functional capacity, including my ability to focus, to block out sensory stimulus, my memory, and even my ability to speak. Finally, my body and brain were boycotting. I realized then that trying to fit into neurotypical society is like being a thespian, an actor in a play, but the whole theater is on fire. <laughs> Late diagnosed autistics are often good at method acting as normal people, at least for a little while. We call this masking, which means to camouflage or repress one's autistic traits for other people's comfort. It includes acts like mimicry and scripting, meaning to rehearse and memorize dialogue and expression ahead of a conversation so you can pass as normal. People like me often don the normal person costume for as long as we can. But sooner or later, the mask doesn't fit. Because masking comes through extreme focused effort and at great personal cost. And autistics that can't mask are seen as a threat and subsequently punished. Punished with social exclusion, unaccommodating environments and widespread discrimination, particularly for marginalized autistics. So whether aut autistics can mask or not, the stage is set. The game is rigged. Studies show that constantly masking autistic traits can have severe repercussions, including mental health issues and a loss of identity. The Australian Senate Select Committee on Autism 
found that 68% of autistic people are socially isolated. 45% are on or under the poverty line. And we are five times more likely to attempt suicide. In 2017, researchers at Columbia University put the average life expectancy of autistic people at 36 years old. That's the age I am now. <coughs> Trying to be more normal is not only burning us out, it's killing us. So autistics and other neurodivergent people through systems of ableism and stigma are penalised for not being normal. However, normal is a construct. It's by definition a set of rules, but they're fluid, contradictory rules, and they're ones everyone is trying and often secretly failing to follow. Because normal is slippery and difficult to master. I've observed normals up close. <laughs> they're not that normal <laughs> in fact who does normal serve at one point or another we've all tried to be something that we're not we've all been reduced to playing a role and following a script model employee perfect mum dream partner and we're all so much more. But here's the good news. Every time you divest from normal, you're helping create a new and better world. Since burning out, I've slowly but surely practiced what it means to be myself. I've found ways to accommodate myself and to ask for accommodations too, including from TEDx. Today I'm speaking early in the program and I have a quiet space I can go backstage if needed. This is to make sure my social and sensory battery is at its fullest. And I'm using a lectern, which is to better regulate my vestibular system, which dictates my sense of balance and body control. And you would have noticed this is a scent-free space. This is because of my sensitivity to smells. These are all pretty easy fixes, especially when tolerating them can come at such a high cost. Accommodations for neurodiverse people mean less private suffering and less clean up. So nowadays, I like to practice showing up imperfectly, dropping the mask when I'm able. And when I choose to wear sunglasses indoors or have earplugs, or turn off the camera on Zoom, or decline a social invitation. I'm living truthfully. And I've turned my interests into a business. I'm a four-time published author, coach, and a creative. And I found something out. It's good to be weird. It pays to be weird. And not just for you. By living authentically, we give other people permission to own their weird. Autism is what makes my life colourful. It makes my brain fast, my senses heightened, and in everyday situations, I can find awe. But neurotypicals can access many of these same traits. Creativity is a perspective. Awe is a practice. And expression is a choice. What interests, what gifts, what glorious weirdness are you sacrificing right now in order to be accepted? Could you get out of your version of an ill-fitting costume? And what deeper levels of self-acceptance could you unlock if you did? We need to rethink normal and reclaim weird. We need to see that the ways in which we've been taught to tone down our true selves are unjust and unsustainable. Trying not to be weird is like smashing a square peg through a round hole. And as the author Paul Collins says, sooner or later, you're destroying the peg. Many autistics today are practicing unmasking as an act of liberation. 
Imagine if neurotypical people helped to make unmasking safe. Imagine if none of us ever had to pretend. While we can never know what it's like to be another neurotype, we all know what it's like to try to be something we're not. We've all worn a mask, however briefly. And while that mask may not have caused you serious suffering, as it can for me, we all deserve to ditch the method acting, to ditch the cosplay and stop pretending to be so normal. So here's the challenge for you. The next time you don't feel like smiling, don't. <laughs> Just don't. Or instead of holding your tongue, sing loudly. <laughs> Choosing to show up just as you are is a personal act of freedom and a collective act of inclusion. It's walking the talk of neurodiversity. So what possibilities would you unlock if you released your inner weirdo? If you questioned a few more norms? Because I dare you to. I dare you to embrace your childhood passions again, to think differently, to move your body weirdly, to care so much about random stuff, it's cringy. <laughs> there are so many supposed aliens like me waiting to welcome you. It's time we looked beyond the binary of normal and weird, of who is acceptable and who is disregarded. It's time we imagine new ways of connecting and creating together so that the next generation of weird kids and adults know without question that they belong on planet Earth.